now uh, we will go to the Q&A. Um, I believe our first caller up will be uh, Guy Norris from Aviation Week. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, please press star followed by one to ask your question. And the first question comes from the line of Mr. Guy Morris with Aviation Week. Please proceed. Oh yes, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, congratulations on the flight. Um, can I just verify, in terms of uh, what's going on with Air Vehicle Two, um, are you? Can you say where you are at that at, that, at the moment with that, and if it's come out of loads testing or uh, what the schedule is for that that vehicle as you approach uh, um, the second part of the year? Yeah. Good morning, guys. It's Giannis. Uh, the uh, airplane has uh, concluded. Uh, the design limit load to 130 uh, percent through its uh, test regime, which uh, will certify it through a two, up to a 2.4 G aircraft uh, um, uh, capability. So the airplane is uh, finished. No test anomalies. The airplane is clearly built uh, Northrop Grumman Heritage tough uh, carrier capable. And so uh, they're rolling the airplane out, getting ready to do fuel testing, and then shortly we'll be doing systems integration and checkout uh, with uh, taxi, uh, engine run taxi testing, and then uh, first flight will be uh, in the summer per schedule. Great, thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Sam Lagong with Jane. Please proceed. Hi, uh, good morning all. Um, trying to figure out how um, the, the UCAS uh, D effort is, uh, is integrating with the, the U class um, effort that, uh, that uh, I think that NAV, uh, NAV Air kicked off uh, last year, I believe. How, I mean, how are these programs related? Uh, uh, could you just clarify that for me, please? Uh, UCAS demo and U class are separate programs. And so, and that's why I said, from, from our perspective, we are about the technology demonstration and we're here to do it and to learn the lessons and flow those into the requirements for U class. But from a, from a programmatic perspective, um, I as PMA 268 um, uh, don't, uh, are, are not speaking for anything that's uh, happening in the future um, in the U class program. Okay, I guess next question, please. And the next question comes from the line of Stephen Trumbull with Flight International Magazine. Please proceed. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, I'm clear. Oh, well, great. I mean, congratulations also on the first flight. Um, I just wanted to make sure, it is it was 29 minutes the original uh, flight test plan for this? Uh, for this event, and and also, what is it? What do you mean when you when you say low observable relevant? What does that mean? It's a term I've I've never heard before. So so the uh, so the, Stephen morning, to be honest, uh, the uh, flight was always between twenty five and twenty nine minutes in that time frame. Huh. Again, just to validate the aero performance characteristics, spoiler flight control surface, and get some speeds across the uh, vehicle management system through the flush mounted data ports, which uh, pick up the, uh, the airspeed. Uh, the, uh, back to your comment on, uh, on LO relevant, it drives itself from the heart of a, of a tailless shape uh, through LO characteristics that, uh, that allow you to build upon, but again, the contract only required the relevancy the flush mounted data ports that are the smooth tapered surface that go along the outer mole line of the airplane flush to the composite structure is, the, is a big part of the heart of the vehicle design characteristics, the inlet, the exhaust area. But those all work together as uh, validating in the first flight too, the flight characteristics, air, air flow through the through those static ports, flush mounted, tapered tail trailing edges, all that works together as a system. Uh, but it's not a full uh, LO uh, stealth broadband aspect uh, uh, aircraft. It wasn't designed that way. I see. And is, is there any RCS 
uh, testing built into the demonstration? Uh, there, there is not. Uh, okay. Not on the UKSD uh, uh, baseline contract. And, and uh, let me uh, elaborate just a little bit. It's, and it goes back into the mission is to look at the aerodynamic shape and the performance in the carrier environment. So there are unique challenges with taking a delta wing, or in this case a crank kite uh, configuration to the, to the ship. So when we say LO relevant, we mean the aerodynamic shape um, that would be necessary and, and looking at the, the performance behind the boat and the air data systems. Um, and then that's, that's where the program uh, stops. Yeah, sorry, was that Giannis or Don? I, I couldn't tell. That was Captain, that was Captain Engel. Oh, was, oh, sorry, and who was the first speaker then? Sorry. That was Giannis. Okay, sorry, thanks. And the next question comes from the line of Caitlin Lee with James Descent Weekly. Please proceed. Uh, yes, hello. Um, this is sort of a follow-up to Steve's question. Um, you mentioned earlier that this was a historic flight test and that 10 years ago this technology wouldn't even be possible. I was wondering if you could kind of describe that a little more specifically. Um, because obviously there's other unmanned aircraft out there that are, that are taking off and landing on the land, and that's what you guys did yesterday. So what about this demonstration vehicle is a historic first? I mean, is there software already in there for the carrier? Are these LO characteristics part of that? What makes this a very unique demonstrator? What about yesterday is, is a breakthrough? And, uh, this is Captain Engel. Uh, that's a great question, and it, it really is one that, that, uh, that fascinates me as, I, as we go through this program, is that um, it, it's really, I think, the autonomous operations uh, that, that is different uh, than the way that many of the unmanned air uh, vehicles are being operated. Um, if we, if we, you know, we talked about the shipboard characteristics to get it on and off the ship, um, but it's the fact that it's designed to uh, check into the uh, carrier control, you know, to the controllers and pass information back and forth and to uh, essentially seamlessly integrate into uh, the carrier operations. And, and that's why I, I pointed you to CV NATOPS because um, I, I would go into a long discussion about, uh, um, you know, coming in and, and holding overhead and uh, the Marshall controller and doing case one and case three approaches. And the whole idea is that the, uh, the air vehicles uh, autonomous out in the uh, carrier control area um, and that it's essentially being controlled uh, like a manned aircraft. Um, and then when it lands, um, then it operates on the carrier deck, uh, uh, you know, with uh, the manned aircraft um, uh, it, it, seamlessly. I hope that that helps frame the. Um, or does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it does. It sounds like so the shipboard capability, and you've had to do some software or stuff. That that's a new challenge. That's kind of the main thing that makes this a little different than maybe other un unmanned aircraft. Right, right. And we use the term uh, contingency management software, and uh, it, and the the system has to go through uh, its different states and and make software decisions. On, on how it's going to fly, um, and, and you know, essentially allows the aircraft to be uh, operate more autonomously. This is Don. I want to add one thing to that as well. The um, so the software that's in there today is the building block for what we're going to integrate. Like the captain said earlier, in parallel, we're developing uh, software and hardware to to continue to build on those interfaces to our final demonstration in 2013. So not all of the software is in there today to enable the, the carrier operations. We have an incremental schedule to be able to build over the next two years to be able to get to that point. Um, so so I, uh, I just wanted to add that in. And, and I think if I, if I could, Kaylin, uh, to add on to the captain Don's comments, uh, I think what then finally drives the robustness of uh, going to the carriers, it's been designed from ground up to be carrier capable. So if you think, think through the tailless shaped assembly and how the software and the algorithms support being able to land and capture the resting gear and the wire and launch from the carrier also, 
that makes this really a true robust autonomous vehicle that doesn't exist right now. All right, so that's why this is a first off. Hey. Okay. Got the next question it comes from the line of Carlos Nunez with the Fifth Valley. Uh, uh, you this is Carl from Defense Daily. Just had a quick question um, as far as uh, possible collaboration with the Air Force. Um, I understand the test flight would, took place at Edwards Air Force Base. Also, um, there is an agreement between the uh, Navy and the Air Force to uh, sort of kind of work together on, uh, on certain issues. Can you give me an idea if there's any sort of lessons learned or anything that could be applicable to the Air Force's effort to uh, stand up a long-range bomber platform? that could be taken from this, uh, this test or this program? Uh, of course, we are collecting lessons learned uh, to propagate to other programs, but we don't have any connection with the Air Force Long Range Bomb. Okay, so as far as some of the, um, the autonomous technologies that you were testing on board the platform today and, and further on down the road, there isn't anything that could be passed on to the Air Force that could possibly help them integrate the same capability on future iterations or the first iteration of the long range strike bomber? Uh, for this program, no. Okay, thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Sid Jennifer with Inside the Navy. Please proceed. Hi, um, I understand that there were some problems on Thursday that prevented you from launching the EGFC, uh in the time window provided um, by Edwards Air Force Base. I was hoping that you could talk in a little bit more detail about what you kind of had to straighten out before you could launch it on uh, yesterday. Uh, okay, and, and really it's... Uh, the, the note sorry, who's speaking right now? Sorry, this is Captain Engdahl. And, okay. and the note I sent up to uh, the Navy leadership um, when we uh, delayed until yesterday, um, this, this is a great time to talk about um, the Edwards Air Force Base and the Air Force support um, that we got for this program. Because we're doing the first flight of an, uh, uh, an X-plane, um, then we had uh, three chase aircraft. We had very complex range um, requirements. Uh, we had to shut down all of the, uh, the roads around the airfield um, to, uh, to do this first flight. So we had a very narrow window um, to complete the test. And so it, it ended up, uh, it was just a, just a couple of minutes. Um, and so it ended up, uh, when everything came together, the, the weather was good, the plan was good, everybody was ready to go. And we had a couple of issues, a, a minor maintenance issue with the auxiliary power generating system. Um, and so we just kind of slid through that window. And by the time they got that uh, uh, taken care of, um, then we didn't have any opportunity. So um, in as a, as a tenant to uh, the good flight test, uh, we had the backup day yesterday, and as you can see, it, it went step by step uh, flawlessly from beginning to end. Okay, um, and I also understand that, you know, there was a day uh, back in December when you were also trying to fly and there was an issue with the braking system that you know, there were some concerns about and you wanted to inspect that a little more before actually flying uh, the aircraft. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about what was the issue with the braking system and, and what you did to resolve that. Yes, Sid, this is Giannis Paulians. Uh, we did have, uh, we, so we've done a number of, uh, of taxi tests, uh, low, medium, high speed buildup, uh, part of the normal progression giving us confidence to fly the airplane and, and we uh, uh, towards the end we uh, started discovering that we had this asymmetrical braking uh, concern that highlighted itself through what was described as uh, a difference in hydraulic pressure that we were seeing towards uh, each of the brakes it was a brake control valve that we changed out and uh, that allowed us to to nominalize the pressure on the left and right side. And then as you take the pilot out of the loop and it's all autonomous with software driving, the algorithms, the speed, electronic sensors, hydraulic, mechanical devices working together, we, we adapted a acceleration and deceleration speeds that would better characterize what we thought we needed to do to, to uh, conduct a uh, quality and safe taxi, taxi uh, uh, motion. And as such, 
like everything else, we got the recipe just right. And uh, we weren't ready to go just before the, the holidays. So we elected to, uh, to work